morning. So as you can see by our bulletin this morning, we had our, uh, we poured our sidewalks in yesterday morning. And by the uh, picture there and the guy in the red sweatshirt does what he typically does, sits around, stands around and watches everybody else do the work. Um, so that was, uh, it was a good day yesterday and everything went well. So um, last couple months or so, um, we talked about revival. And I kind of gave up on it a little bit, um, stopped talking about it because I didn't want to bother the church with uh, the same thing over and over and over again. Um, meanwhile, my friend Chip back here stayed on it. And over the last uh, several months, um, life has been good for me, but my prayers have been uh, a little foggy. Uh, you know, prayers here, prayers at home. It's just uh, it's been out of sorts a little bit. And I, I was missing something. I just couldn't figure out what I was missing. So Chip uh, was gracious enough to send me an email the other, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it was about revival. And I looked at it and uh, didn't, deep, and didn't dig deep as, uh, as I should have. Um, but the other day, I uh, realized that I actually stopped talking about revival. And I felt like this is something that I need to bring up again. And I felt like God was saying something to me. And I said, well, if pastor asked me to speak this morning, I'll bring it up. But yesterday morning, as we were getting set up for the, uh, the pouring of the sidewalks, Eric, he's our video guy, said he was going to miss Sunday and I'm going to be up there. And I just assumed that pastor wasn't going to call on me this morning. And sure enough, yesterday afternoon, he sends me an email saying that, would you mind opening up? So to me, that's just the good Lord saying, you know what, you haven't talked about it long enough. So I'm here to talk about, uh, about, uh, about revival. And I feel that this church does many things together. We, uh, we work together, we play together, we picnic together. We do uh, abundance of that. We do Bible study together. Um, but I don't feel we built, a, we built a building together. And that was pretty impressive from a church like us. Um, but we need to, I feel like we need to pray together. Um, we need to build this church together. And I feel that, you know, we need to do this um, not as individuals, but as a group. And... You know, we need to pray for, as uh, our friend Jim Taylor said uh, many months ago, that, you know, we pray for the guy in front of us, behind us, left of us, and right of us, not only in this building, but outside this building. And I feel that uh, we, a lot of us, you know, including myself, we might pray for ourselves and not for our fellow man or for the community as a whole. Um, the best way for, for me to explain this is, if anyone has issues with um, school system, work, uh, church, the community, and if you went as individuals to the person in charge, um, one at a time, you know, yeah, you, you, your, you, your voice is heard. But if we go as a group, 50 of us at a time, I think that's a little more powerful statement. So I feel, you know, the same with the Lord. You know, if we, you know, I know we all pray, but we pray, uh, as individuals in our own due time, which is, that's great. Um, but I feel as, as a church that we should do this together. Um, so we handed out a flyer uh, some time ago and we had everybody to sign up different times and dates. And, and I'm not sure if that's working, if people are holding true to that. Um, so I'm just going to say that there's a group of us that pray at 9 p.m. every single night, seven days a week. Um, am I diligent at 9 p.m.? For the most part, but I, you know, there's times that, you know, for whatever reason, um, I, I miss, like sometimes I'm at 9.30 or what have you. Um, but including myself, I think we need to be more diligent, more um, conscious and be aware of that. I think a 9 p.m. Is a, is a fair time. So if you, if you're, whatever you're doing at 9 p.m., if you just pray for your fellow guy, pray for the community, pray for this church, pray for revival, I think we'll go uh, just, a, just a long way um, for this community, for our church as a whole. 
uh, just to me it feels just a stronger message to the Lord that we're doing something together. And uh, if you can join us, that'd be great. And if you're doing something else that you uh, feel is adequate enough, then fine, that's, that's okay. Um, but I just felt it was on my heart to, to talk about it, and um, so I am. And I'll continue to until the Lord tells me to stop. So if you join me in morning prayer, please. Father, thank you for all who is here today. I am grateful and thankful for this opportunity to come before you, speak, and I hope in, uh, that I have this opportunity to, to bring you glory, Father, in all that I do for you in purpose, my purpose in life, Father, in serving you, and I pray for our fellow man, the people in this church, Father, people in this community, find their purpose in life, use their God-given talents, their spirit-filled lives, to utilize, Father, at their fullest, to bring you glory. I pray, Father, that we, as a church, our new property, we use this, Father, to bring this community together in revival, that uh, it draws people, new and old, Father, to our new home, that this property will absolutely stand before you, Father, God willing, to the end of time, drawing people, Father, close and near to, Father, worship, fellowship, um, what have you, just to sit with you, Father. I hope that we, as a group, Father, follow the path that you put before us, seeking your will, trusting and having faith in you, bringing love not only to one another, but outside this community, outside this church, Father, to all who need it, in the name of your Son. Amen. Amen.
He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. Oh, how grace abounds. We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. There was good news for the captive. There was good news for the one who walked away There was good news for the doubter The one religion failed For the good Lord has come to seek and save He's our rescuer From sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. Oh, how peace the mouth. We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. He is beauty for the blind man, riches for the poor. He is friendship for the one the world ignores. For the weary, the best for those who strive. For oh, the good Lord is the way, the truth, and life. For oh, the good Lord is the way, the truth, and life. He's our Wishful eye to 
pain and spare and happy land where my possessions lie. Oh, whose wide extended plain shines one eternal day where God the sun forever reigns and scatters Anybody know how the Bible begins? Do you remember what the first words of the Bible are? In the beginning, what happened? Does anybody know? That's going to be your lesson today. And uh, as you go to children's church, you're going to be studying about that. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, you knew that. You were just embarrassed to say it. God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the Bible also tells me that I need to be as much as I can like God, right? So I decided this week I was going to create something, okay? And I can't create works of art or anything like that, but I decided I would create something. Let me show you what I created. Mm. That's That's what I created. Now, you know how I created that? What is it? I started with gluten-free cookie mix 
as chocolate chip cookie mix. And I said, okay, well, that's good. But you know, just chocolate chip cookies, anybody can do that, right? And so I went to the store and I bought me some M&Ms. And I put M&Ms in my cookies. And I bought some more chocolate chips and I put more chocolate chips in my cookies. And then I bought candy kisses and put them on top. I bought the Hershey's Kisses and put them on top. So what I created was a quadruple chocolate cookie, okay? Does that sound good to you? How many of you like chocolate? How many of you like the taste of my creation? Would you like nobody? Say, yeah, some of you would like to do that. Well, maybe you'll get to do that. So I created these cookies. Now, if you could go to the store, and if you looked where they've got gluten-free cookies, you will not find, I have never found, quadruple chocolate cookies. So I created that. If you ever see it in the store, you know they copied after me, right? So I created that. And I said that I wanted to create something so I could be like God. But was I successful? What do you think? You know, when the Bible says, in the beginning, God created, there's a word that He uses for created that is never used of anything else except what God did. When it says God created, there was something about that that God did something nobody else could ever do. You know what He did? He created everything that we see, and He didn't have to go to the store and buy things to do it. Did you know that? What was there for God to create this world out of? Was there anything around? Was there anything? No, there was only God. And so when He created, He created out of nothing. Now, can you get something from nothing? No, you can't, but you know what? God can. And He had nothing to begin with, but He created everything, the stars, the sun and the moon, the plants that we see, all the animals of the earth, He created all of those and He did it out of nothing. You see, God did something none of us could ever do. And so I think we need to thank Him for that, don't you? Let's thank Him. God, You are so great. You are so wonderful. God, as we look at Your creation, we begin to uh, just know of Your power, to know of Your love to know, dear God, that you've made all this for us. And dear God, you did what nobody else could ever do. For without you, there would be nothing except you. Without you doing it, Lord, there would just be an emptiness. But thank you that you created this world for us, that we might enjoy it. And so I pray that you will bless the children as they study this, as they think about this, and that, Lord, they would just understand how great and powerful you are. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Well, amen. If you're not ready to open the scripture by now. Sorry about that. We're going to do it anyway, all right? We're going back to the very first page of the Bible. The great thing about going to Genesis 1 is everybody can find it in the Bible. So if you have one, turn it there, and, and we'll see just what God has to uh, say to us. Now, over the next five weeks, we're going to be focusing on the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. Now, we could spend a lot longer than that, but we're going to be following along with it even as the children are following along with the same lessons. So you'll be getting what they're getting and, and you'll be able to talk with them and it's just a wonderful opportunity for us to, to do that. You know, I heard it said that if you could can cause people to doubt these first 11 chapters, you can destroy their faith. For you know that as we study this, this is the foundation. And if you want to destroy something, just destroy the foundation. And you've destroyed it all. It'll all come tumbling down. Now as I open the Word of God and open it to the book of Genesis, I want to tell you that after 54 years as a believer, when I open the Bible, I open it with the conviction that it is the inspired Word of God. 
I make no apologies for that. I believe that's exactly the way that you should open the Scripture, saying, God, this is your word, and I believe it. Now, what do you have to tell me in this word? Now, if it is the inspired word of God, then that means when it speaks of history, when it speaks of geography, or when it speaks of things scientific, these things we are to accept as true. Now, does the Bible have a full explanation of all of those areas? Well, of course not. But what it says is true. Now, my approach to the Scripture can be criticized as not being a scientific approach because a true scientist is supposed to begin his study with no preconceived ideas. I begin my study believing that there is a God. I begin my study believing that He is the only possessor of complete truth. I begin my study believing that He has revealed the truth that we need to know through men who, as Peter told us recently, were moved by the Holy Spirit as far as what they were to write. And what they were told to write, they wrote. And so we can trust the Word of God. Now what we find in the first chapter of the book of Genesis is a staggering display of divine power. The whole wonderful record of creation is compressed in that majestic opening verse where we read, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, if you believe that, you're well on your way to understanding the Scripture. Now, while I admit and I already have that my approach to the matter of creation is not purely scientific, I would point out to you that those who reject the biblical record of creation and replace it with an evolutionary approach are not pure scientists either. The evolutionists begin their study with the idea that there is no God, that there are no such things as miracles, and that there is nothing supernatural, that all things, therefore, must be the result of natural phenomena. Now, what is the problem with believing that everything that is now present in this world evolved from something else? Well, you have heard in the discussion of evolution about the missing link. Well, I want to tell you I'm not as concerned about that missing link and them finding that as I am concerned about their missing anchor point of that chain of what they consider to be truth. You know, if my neighbor owned a ferocious dog, a dog that was a threat to life and limb, I would be so glad if that neighbor of mine would buy the strongest chain known to man. For such a beast live next door, I would want it to be secured by a chain. But you know that chain would be of no use if it was not secured to an anchor point. Something strong enough, stronger than that dog, so that the dog could not simply break free. Evolutionists have no such anchor for their very dangerous theory. And I will describe it as dangerous because it separates God from His creation. And it undermines the integrity of the Word of God. So is evolution fact or theory? Well, you know it is simply a theory because it cannot be proven. It is all based on speculation and every new discovery is made to fit that theory. And we hear about it so often that we have somehow come to think that this is fact. Well, is creationism fact or theory? You may be surprised when I tell you that it is also a theory. But the difference between the two theories is one theory is based upon no God and the other theory is based on the fact that God exists and that the Bible is true. You see, it is technically theory because we cannot 
prove scientifically what the Bible says about creation. To be proven, it would have to be capable of being duplicated in a laboratory, and that cannot be done any more that you can pr than you can prove to someone that God exists. It is still a matter of faith. Evolutionists say that we accept creation on blind faith. And then they ask us to accept evolution, which requires blinder faith. And what of those who would mix the two together in what has been called deistic evolution? In other words, you can believe that there is a God and you can believe that there is evolution. And what you believe is that God is the one who began all things and He used evolution to bring about His creation. This approach tries to see evolution as true and just argue that God was an actor behind the scenes. Now to those who want to argue for such a compromise, I point you to the clear wording of this first chapter of God's Word. In the beginning, God did what? He created the heavens and the earth. He is the one who created all that is around us, and He did it at a definite point in time. God created everything. This is what the Bible says. Now that necessitates God being there before anything was created. And the truth was and is that He was. Now the Bible speaks of our God as being eternal. It speaks of Him as being infinite and existing independently of the universe that He created. Note that the writer of Genesis does not set out to prove His existence. His existence and our acceptance of His existence are assumed by the writer. And this God has, if you will, personality. He hears, He sees, He knows, He feels, He wills, and He acts. He is a person. Now I am fascinated to think about what this person was doing before what is termed in the beginning. Well, the Bible gives us some ideas. Jesus, God the Son, said to God the Father in John chapter 17, verse 24, You loved me before the foundation of the world. God the Father, God the Son had that relationship together from eternity past. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, we read these words. Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through Him believe in God, who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Now what does that say to us? It tells us that the plan of salvation was already in place before anything was created. Before there was ever man, God already had a plan to save man from his sins. Our God planned to save man from sin before he was ever created. In Titus chapter 1 verse 2, Paul speaks of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Eternal life promise before God time began. Now when I speak of God, I am speaking of the triune God. The Bible declares that all three persons of the Trinity were united in the work of creation. Isaiah speaks of the Father's role in creation, where in chapter 42 verse 5 he says, Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it. John speaks of Christ's part in creation wherein he says in those first three verses of his epistle, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Jesus, the agent of creation, 
Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 gives us a glimpse of the fact that the Holy Spirit was active in this task of creation. For it says in verse 2 that the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. That Hebrew word signifies a vibrant, intense moving or a protective hovering. In our text itself, we see the true personality of this one personal God when it says in in the beginning, God created. Well, that word God, if you look back at the Hebrew, you'll find that to be the word Elohim, which is a plural word for the word God. God is El. God's is Elohim. And so is here, uses the, the plural to speak about God. But we cannot do that in translation here. We can't say God's created because the word created is a singular verb and by itself would be translated He created. And thus the Bible begins with a plural subject, a plural word for God and a singular verb. And how does that come about? I believe that that tells us from the very first verse of the Bible, the trifaceted nature of God there in the very beginning. God created, yes, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all involved in creation. And what of Genesis chapter 1 verse 26? Now we'll talk about this more next week. But it says, Then God said, Let us, singular or plural, Make man an hour, again plural, image, singular. According to our, plural, likeness, singular. We'll talk about that next week. Can you wrap your mind around what I've just told you? Well, if you think you can, you're greatly mistaken. It was none other than the Apostle Paul who said in 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. So we worship Him, though we can never explain Him. He is far above us. In the beginning, God created. That word created has two powerful facts surrounding it. First, it is used in the Bible to describe divine activity exclusively. It describes something extraordinary. It describes something that only God can do. And only He can do what is described by this word created. It is something we could never do. This is the word that in Hebrew that can describe creation as being ex nihilo, the Latin term, which means out of of nothing. He created out of nothing. And only God could do that. Now I believe in a powerful God who doesn't need ingredients to create. If He had needed something out of which to create what He created, nothing would have been created. Now what I just said is perfectly logical because all there was available before He created something was nothing. That was all that was available for Him to work with is nothing. Sometimes you moms feel that way. How am I going to fix supper? I have nothing, nothing, nothing. Well, God had absolutely nothing. Nothing, not the first beginning of anything, but he created out of nothing. Now we know that when he created, nobody was there to watch him because nobody had been created yet. And thus the only way we have an account of what happened is that God told the writer what had happened. He got with Moses, he revealed it to Moses. I believe when it was up, when it was up on the mountain with Moses that he explained it all to him, that he let him see all of that. The only account we have is what God told the writer. Now think about it. Knowledge of this aspect of the history of the universe can only come by divine revelation. And therefore the reasonable assumption is that God would have given the writer words to state precisely the nature of the beginning so there would be no doubt concerning the origin of things. And you know, if man does something, it can get messed up. But this writer either had a fanciful imagination and he wrote it all down and deceived the world with it, or 
God instructed him, even as we found, even as in Peter's writing, he spoke about this word being inspired, being God breathed. We see that and we believe that. It is God who has done it. The, writer, the writers in the New Testament understood the book of Genesis. They knew the book of Genesis. They could quote the book of Genesis. And all of that they said was breathed out as though God said it Himself. Now this word created, in the Hebrew sentence, created comes before God in the beginning, created God the heavens and the earth. Now the reason the word order is that for is for emphasis. Whatever word is put forward in the sentence is the, is the word that's being emphasized at that moment. And in that moment it is emphasizing this matter of creation. This work of the all-powerful one. Now there's a key verse with all of this. And I hope you'll remember it. I hope you'll write this one down or I hope you'll listen to it later and get it off of YouTube, whatever you need to do. But Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. In that chapter of faith, here is what it says. He says, by faith we understand, okay? By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. We look at things today and we try to figure out what took place way back then by looking at things the way that they are now. And it can't be done. And the Bible says that it can't be done. You cannot take the things that you see now and try to go backwards and see what it was in the beginning because some very dramatic things have happened and we'll talk about those in the next couple of weeks. You look the world over and you will not find the ingredients for God's creation of the world for there is but one ingredient and that is the power of God Himself. All God had to do was to speak a word and what He spoke into existence appeared. Psalm 33 verse 6 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. All He had to do was speak and it was created. You remember that the disciples marveled that the wind ceased and the sea rested when Christ spoke a word. Now just as easily as that, God spoke those very seas into existence just by speaking a word. In fact, the world itself and all that we know was created by His Word and He did not need millions of years to do it. But further, we know that God created everything good. That's what the Bible says. Everything was created good. It says beginning in verse 3, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And thus God made the firmament, and it divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and gathering together, of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning Morning were the third day. Now what I want to point out to you is that there was nothing random about anything that God did in creation. He has a purpose in everything He does. So then, why did He create the heavens and the earth? You know why He did it? 
He did it for us. And we haven't yet read about our creation. Again, we'll talk about that later. But He created the heavens and the earth and He did it for you and He did it for me. You see, the earth was decked with flowers and the heavens were made bright by the sun, moon, and stars for our benefit. No matter where we look, we see thought, we see design, we see purpose in everything that He has created. Somebody looks out there and sees the stars and, and they're too numerous to, to count and we just see them as a little point of light and they're still discovering stars that were out there. Do you know how, why that star is there that they just discovered? It is for us. For us. That's what the Scripture tells us. That's what He tells us. No matter where we look, there is that design. Psalm says, and the psalmist says in 104 verse 24, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. Why did He create this world? He created it that it might be inhabited. The Bible says so. Isaiah 45, 18 says, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. Why did He create this world the way He did it? He created it for those who would inhabit the earth. Those who would live upon the earth. Have you ever thought about the fact that if the earth had been if the sun had been placed any closer to earth, the earth would have burned up and it would be uninhabitable? If he had placed it any further away, the earth would have been a frozen mass and it would be uninhabitable. But he created earth with the purpose of it being the habitation of man, so he placed it exactly where it is. Not an accident. They can spend billions of dollars looking for another planet like it and you'll not find one like this one. This one was created for man. This one was created for us. Now we could go through every facet of the created order and see it is, that it is exactly as it should be to fulfill the purpose for which God intended it because it was created for us. He created it all good. He didn't create something and set it in motion so that it could become good. Did you hear me? He didn't create something and set in motion some process so that it could become good. He created it and pronounced it good. It was good as soon as He created it. How much time did He take to create it? Here's a big question that people ask. Well, if He created it to be inhabited, don't you think He'd want it to be habitable as soon as possible? He did it in a period of time described in Genesis chapter 1 as the evening and the morning. What did the writer understand that to mean? He understood that to mean a 24-hour day. What did the readers in Israel understand that to mean? They understood it to be a 24-hour day. As we read it and we read the evening and the morning, there it is, black words on white paper. We believe it to be the Word of God. He says the evening and the morning were the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day. He didn't say the first eon of, of millions of years, the second eon of millions of years. No, heavens, you can't even follow that pattern that He has and see how it could all be done over millions of years in the order that it is given in the Scripture. Folks, we need to go back to the Word of God. I don't understand everything but I know this, God's Word is true. And we need to stand upon it. So if God created earth suddenly, how can it have the appearance of age? Well, He didn't have to wait for something to grow. By the end of the third day, there were full-grown trees and full-grown plants of every variety. You see that tree out there in the field, you say, ah, that didn't just happen today. That took years and years and years for it to, uh, to be able to grow to the place that it is. Those first trees that were there on earth, 
If Adam had chopped one down, would it have had rings within it? We know that trees have rings to tell us how old they are. Did those, were those trees without rings? No, I think they had the appearance of age, even as the earth had the appearance of age. Now, if God could speak it into existence, He didn't have to start with an embryo to create man. He didn't have to start with a seed to create a plant. He didn't have to plant it and then pray to Himself, asking that it might grow. No, He created, and it was done. And He could do in a day what could not be done by man over thousands of years. When He created Adam and Eve... They were full grown. They had the appearance of age, and the earth did as well. You see, we don't have to fit the story of creation into man's theory of evolution. We view the story of creation against the backdrop of our great and mighty God, who all He had to do was to speak, and it happened. That's all He had to do. Not over millions of years or thousands of years. Everything, the Scripture says, as clearly as the writer could say it, took place in six literal days. The evening and the morning. And God created everything good. Not with death but with life. And He created everything glorious. When we marvel at creation, we should actually be marveling at the Creator. Look what God did. On Friday, we went to the Norman Rockwell Museum. Uh, recently, Martha and I went up to the Clark Art Institute I may not look like it, but I, I love the great masters. I love those old paintings. I love to see what they did. I look at those and I, I marvel at them, not in the work of art so much as I, as I picture that artist and what great talent that he had. I think, wow, look how he brought forth the face of that person to where when you look at it, it looks like they're, 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 they're real life. You can see that model that he was painting. And we look at it, I look at it and I think, wow, what a great artist that guy was. What talent he had. Well, God created everything glorious. And it is all to His glory and to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to listen to what the Apostle Paul says in regard to creation and its Creator. He is speaking of Jesus when he says in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 18, He is the image of the invisible God. That word image doesn't mean a copy. That means the exact representation. He was equal with the invisible God, but He was to where that He could be seen. The firstborn over all creation, that doesn't mean that He was born and He was created. He didn't know. That means that He was at the peak, that He was the ultimate uh, over all of creation, that everything points to Him. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him. Right? And do you notice what it says next? For Him. Now I told you that this world was created with us in mind. Right? It was created for us, but you know why we were created? We were created for Him. And all that we see about us will ultimately find its fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul says in the book of Romans that this, this whole creation groans waiting for that day when it will be freed from this existence of death. And He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. You will remember that Jesus says in Revelation 21 verse 6, And He said to me, It is done. Jesus says, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and 
then he's the fulfillment of everything. He was there in the beginning. He created all things and he is going to be there in the end. Now, if we miss the greatness and the glory of God in creation, we're going to miss the very point of creation. God created this world for us. He created us for fellowship with him. Listen to the last part of that verse in Revelation 21, 6, where Jesus says, I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirst. Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are weary, and I will give you rest. He tells us we're thirsty to come to him, and he will give us strength. He is the great and the mighty Lord, and everything is to his glory. Don't make the mistake of thinking that you can exalt Christ and belittle creation because it is His work. It is His work. It is a very important thing that we say, that we believe, that we live as though the Word of God is true because that is our only foundation. Don't let that foundation be taken away from you. It doesn't matter where the world thinks that we're idiots to believe it. I think they're idiots for believing something else because the Word of God is so clear. Let's just go back to the Word of God and see what it says. You know, in British Columbia, 500 miles northeast of Vancouver, the Fraser River parts into two streams. One runs into the Atlantic Ocean, the other one runs west to the Pacific Ocean. Once that water is parted, its direction is fixed. The fork in that river is called the Great Divide. Well, the Bible begins with the words, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. You must decide what you believe about those words. If you decide that they are merely the words of some primitive man arising from his imagination to tell of something he could not know, then your direction is fixed. You are in the stream of secular reasoning which will lead you to deny all that is truly holy. But if you decide that these are the words of God given to a man through divine inspiration to tell of something that only God could know and that he stated it as clearly as it needed to be stated, then your direction is fixed. You are in the river of, of faith and that faith will lead you to Jesus. It will lead you to fellowship with God as you have faith in Jesus. Now I want you and I want your children to know Him and to experience all that God has for you for you I want you to believe that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth I want you to have that foundation of faith and everything else builds upon that we're going to look at some of these passages some of these things that people doubt and I'm going to tell you what the Bible has to say. I'm not smart enough to tell you anything else. But I'm too smart to tell you anything else. Chip, Jan, Lisa, come. We'll close out with this song. What is it that God has been saying to you? Satan is trying to tell you, well, that guy, bless his old foggy heart, he doesn't know any better. But the Holy Spirit is saying to you, you know, this is the Scripture. This is the truth. And all that He's told you is what the Bible has to say. Now you deal with it. You deal with it. There is a candle
Bye.